Hello, this is Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. I'm shooting from the Lug Nuts facility. And what I have behind me here are um, a collection of uh, classic cars. Some are client cars that we're, that we're servicing. Um, others are my own cars, which, which I've uh, bought and um, fixing up um, for resale. And, and, and some are client cars with, that I'm selling um, on their behalf. So I thought it might be interesting just to go through what we have in the shop right now and describe to you, you know, the, the projects that we're involved with and, uh, and some of the work and some, and some of the, the, you know, the invoices and money that it takes to recondition some of these cars. So um, I'll turn this camera around and we'll just go through what we have here. We've got, we've got three, three classic Mercedes. Uh, a 78 450 SLC, uh, an 89 420 SEL, uh, W126, and a 97 500 SL, that's an R29, that's right in the foreground. But uh, I'll, uh, we also have a 82 um, Citroen 2CB6 Charleston, and then a Porsche, an 81 Porsche 928. The cars on the lift are in the bay, those are client cars, and that's a a 57 300 SL Roadster, Mercedes-Benz, and a 1973 Jaguar E-Type. So, I don't know, kind of a neat collection of cars. Let's turn the camera around and maybe I'll start with the Porsche 928. Okay, so this is the 1981 Porsche 928. And I'd heard about this car for some time, um, that it had, uh, that it was a 81 928, five-speed manual transmission with only 20,000 kilometers. And so I was chasing the car for the better part of a year and uh, it finally came up and, uh, and, I, and, and, and I bought the car. Um, it did have a couple problems. One of them, well, the main one is it hadn't run in 40 years. Um, and uh, so there's significant unknowns, you know, when you buy, buy a car like that. And uh, so, but with the mileage and the overall condition, you know, I just couldn't resist. Like the interior in this car, um, looks almost new. You can see that it's got, uh, you know, these leather, uh, hand-stitched leather dash top and leather door cards. Um, and then, you know, leather door handles and these pieces here on the, on the armrest are leather. You know, leather for the, the glove box uh, covering and, um, you know, the center console. Um, what happens to 928s is, well, first of all, they don't all have leather dashes. And I'm not sure which years do or which years don't or whether it was an option or not. Um, but it seems to be, you know, mostly just the early ones where you get, I uh, could be wrong on that, but uh, where you get this leather. And probably the reason, uh, the reason that, that they're rare is that they don't age particularly well. And of course, the leather is uh, a natural product, and it'll shrink. And so, what what I see on just about every 928 with a leather dash covering is I see these gaps that uh, that uh, start to change for some reason, um, and then we see the leather sort of pull back um, from the top of the dash and around the vents and so on. And this whole area. Uh, with the glove box and center console and so on starts to look pretty messy and uh, that's like almost impossible to fix. Uh, one, you can't, you, the tanning is now water-based instead of uh, solvent-based and, and the leather is not the same and then to be able to get somebody to do that is almost impossible. I don't even know where I'd take the car to uh, have a new leather dash fitted. I've seen you know, cars where it's been re redone and it absolutely just doesn't look the same. I mean, maybe if you went to, you know, Paul Russell or something and, and known for his, you know, million dollar Pebble Beach restorations, they would figure it out. But um, locally, I have no idea. So to find a car where, you know, you've got, first of all, a leather dashboard, which I really like. And second of all, one that, that hasn't been um, sun damaged or shrunk. Um, is, uh, is uh, you know, really quite remarkable. Also, you know, on other 928s I've been involved with, once you start taking them apart, you know, if you have to get into the climate control or if you have to get in there or something, they don't always go back together, at least the ones I've seen. And so just to get one that hasn't been touched is, uh, is like a major, uh, a major benefit. And then with the, the seats, 
I mean, it's still like, I don't know. They're not, the leather's not dried out at all. It feels like, like brand new leather. So there's no cracking and there's no bolster wear. Of course, you wouldn't expect that many people would sit in the back um, and they haven't, but uh, um, even the roof, you know, we can see even the, the headliner, um, you know, isn't sagging. And anyway, the, the overall interior is just in absolutely mint shape. And that's just something that uh, you can't replace. Um, we do have a problem with this radio. Um, and it turns on. And uh, I've got a... Um, oh, the car's not very happy because the front of the engine's taken off right now. Um, uh but I can't get the radio to work, so I don't know what's going on with that and what the solution is there to... Blahpunkt makes like a reproduction Bamberg. Um, I think it's a Bamberg anyway. Um, and, uh, it, you know, but with updated with Bluetooth, you know, uh, plugins for your phone, etc. So that could be an option. Or I have a really interesting Blaupunkt Berlin, if that, I can fit it. Or we can send that away a, a way to get it uh, repaired. Or a combination of all of them. So anyway, we're still working on that. Here is this um, Blaupunkt Berlin um, that I mentioned. And, um, you know, this was, I mean, these, this was the highest end stereo you could buy in the 70s and 80s. All of the, you know, the, the roofs and the Koenigs and the exotic b and b all the exotic uh tuner porsches and so on had uh had this radio on it i think it was a couple thousand dollars in the 80s i did i did drive it um and uh it 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 wasn't very happy and 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 it didn't run very well and with the first time it had run in 40 years um uh the the previous owner had you know, attended to, you know, the fuel system and drained the gas out and, you know, replaced the fuel filter and done a few things just to make sure that, uh, you know, we weren't going to clog up the injection system with, um, uh, with uh, uh, a bunch of uh, sediment from the gas tank and so on. But when we finally did fire, fire it up, it was pretty reluctant. And then I only had a couple of the gears. I think I only had second and fourth gear. Okay, so... So just, we, we did that and, you know, tried to figure out what was wrong with it and what was going to take, what it was going to take to recommission it as they, uh, as they, as they say, didn't really know what, what the problems were. Okay. So we, we got into the car, uh, and, you know, spent a month on it, just trying to sort it out. And, um, uh, with the, with the, the, the gear uh, the gear selection issue. The 928s have a gearbox in the rear. It's a rear transaxle car. And that's why you see that, you know, this big bump. Um, you know, that big, that big um, uh, lump between the seats is the cover for the uh, rear transaxle. And that's why the kind of the rear seats are so small. Anyway, um, so there's quite a long, there's a, you know, the engine up front and then a torque tube to the rear transaxle. And a fairly long gear linkage and what I've learned about the 928s is if you know it gets subjected to you know a rough shift um, then what it can do is um, dislodge some of the components in the shift linkage and that is what happened and so the linkage in this car basically sits on top of the torque tube which sits on top of the exhaust and um, there is a sort of a ball joint and uh, a cup with a kind of a Teflon insert that basically anchors the front of the shift linkage. And that cup can pop off the ball joint, which is attached to the top of the torque tube, which isn't really a big deal because in theory, because you can just pop it back on again, except like anything with a 928, getting at it is a real problem. And so you have to drop the exhaust and then you have to get in there behind the torque tube and there's not a lot of room to, uh, a lot, lot of room to move in it, lot, not a lot of access. And so we finally, you know, got the $5 part, which was the Teflon insert and managed to attach the cup back onto the ball joint with a new insert and we've got to put this back together, okay? So that was one sort of big unknown. 
uh, with the car and we did that. Now the second one was, it ran, but not very well. Um, and uh, we went through the obvious things like distributor cap and spark plug wires and spark plugs and did various tests and went back and forth with a bunch of theories. And um, uh, finally we did a compression test uh, which indicated that um, the compression on one bank of cylinders was uniformly lower than the compression on the other bank of cylinders. So of course, what would lead you know that to happen? Uh, we did a bore scope, and the bores were look new. Very little carbon buildup in the in the uh, in the cylinder. So we we had done. Uh, so we, we, we didn't figure we had a problem with the bores itself, but what we kind of quickly came to the conclusion is, is that we had a problem with the, the valve timing. And so what had happened, and, and just piecing together the history of the, of the, of the car, is that what, what we think happened is that, you know, somebody made a hard shift, popped this piece off the linkage, uh, then couldn't be bothered to fix the car. Um, the, the owners, uh, uh, and this is second hand, but they moved around a lot and the guy was working up in Fort McMurray and I just don't think he ever got around to fixing the car. Um, and uh, so what, uh, what happened was, then we think what happened is the first time it started, the belt skipped on this pulley. And when we took the, when we took the covers off, and check the timing of the belt, we found significant slack. So that's what happened. Somebody, some, you know, the first time somebody tried to turn the car over, you know, the belt slipped on this and, and put this bank of cylinders out of time. Um, and then that explained the low compression on uh, one of these bank of cylinders because some of the valves are still open. And so we're giving this car a, you know, of course a new timing belt. And when you're in there, we do the water pump as well. That's normal maintenance for a 928. Um, so we've got from Pelican Parts, you know, a big box of um, tune-up parts, all the belts and hoses and so on, including a new timing belt. So we will um, fit the new timing belt in, time it uh, correctly, and then restore the, you know, the compression on this one bank of cylinders. And we should have a perfectly healthy engine with a new timing belt. And we also bought sort of new, um, new vacuum hoses and, uh, and uh, you know, all the different belts and water hoses in the engine. So we'll freshen this car up. So those are the two problems uh, that the car had. Um, uh, the previous owner bought new tires from it. I think I'm going to change these out to P7s. The bodywork is fantastic. There's a couple little marks on the car, a couple little stone chips, and there's a one little scuff on the front bumper there, and a little scuff on the rear uh, bumper cover there. The interior is amazing, and uh, anyway, this one isn't too far away from from being a runner, and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll, like we said, we'll do the service. We did all the rest of the usual services as well. Oil and of course we'll have to do coolant and so on because we, we drain it to do the water pump. Okay, so that's that. 81, 928, five speed with uh, uh, 25,000 original kilometers on the car. Well, uh, the 928, um, I mean, the first thing we did when we got the car uh, you know, it had, like I said, it had been sat for you know, 40 years. And so the first thing that was done to it was just a thorough cleaning and cryoblasting. So the car came in and, uh, you know, we put it on the hoist and we, you know, used a cryo, cryo machine. And then the, the entire, you know, undercarriage and engine bay of the car was, was cryoblasted. And that, that took a long time. That was, you know, it was probably, it was probably seven or eight hours. And uh, those machines can run anywhere from 200 to $500 an hour. So, you know, you might expect to bill, uh, and it's not much fun either. Um, you might expect to bill just to clean it, uh, degrease it and clean it of a couple thousand dollars. 
Um, and then there is the paint. Uh, it was in pretty good shape, but you know, we still, you know, detailed it inside and out and polished it. I think we just went to a, a coarse polish. We'll leave the fine polish to when the car is done. But there's another couple of days on just uh, paint preparation. So what are we at? 3000 for the cleaning and cryoblasting, uh, 2000 for the uh, water pump labor and timing belt labor. Uh, you know, so that's five. Um, another, even conservatively, a thousand for the shift linkage. Um, that's six. Two thousand for the um, the all the new parts, the tune-up parts that we put into it. Okay, um, so we're at what is that? Eight thousand dollars already. Um, I wasn't really happy with the tires. Um, they're fine, but you know this car really should have Pirelli P7s on it, and these are Firestones, so, and the, and the correct tires, the, the new re remanufactured correct P7 Cinturato tires, uh, that's about $3,000. Um, so we're at 11. Um, what else do we have to do to it? Um, then we get the car together and start uh, test driving it and so on. There may be some water leaks. And there, you know, will probably be some incidentals. So, you know, on a car like this, only 25,000 kilometers, um, looks basically new. There's virtually no paint work, a couple touch-up, you know, touch-up areas. There's no interior work. Um, you know, mechanically, it's excellent, except for, you know, basically just the maintenance on the car. And, uh, you know, it's still going to be 15,000 Canadian to sort this car out, uh, to sort it out properly. Okay, so that's the math on an early 928. Now, if you're getting in there and you're doing engine work um, and interior work and or paint work or whatever, you know, that, that number can, can mushroom pretty quickly. Um, I've restored or refurbished three 928s. Um, when I was at Porsche, no, four. This is the fourth one. So with Porsche, I did three of them. Um, I had a, uh, a really low mileage, beautiful 928 GTS that had been looked after its whole life and was in fantastic shape. And it just needed um, water pump and belt, belt service and a major service. Little else. And that, that was 10,000. Um, I had a, uh, an 88 928 S4. It was a terrible car. It had been crashed and, and you know, I don't know, some kid or something in his backyard was trying to fix it. And I got the car and I really didn't do my, you know, I, I kind of bought it from somebody who should have known better uh, to sell it to me. Uh, but it, in the end, it, and I, I did get a mechanical uh, assessment of it but that wasn't done very well and anyway I got stuck with this thing and I spent 25,000 on that car and it was still a car it was still it was still a bad car um, so that it was almost open-ended but the worst one I had was a 93 nine, another 93 928 GTS and it was a little bit rougher it wasn't necessarily a bad car but Automatic 928s, the S4s and the GTSs, um, have an issue with the torque tubes and the play in like a flexible plate that is attached to the crankshaft. And what can happen is if the car is roughly treated, the, um, the, uh, the drive shaft and torque tube can put pressure on this flex plate and this flex plate uh, can put enough pressure on the crank that it actually starts to move the crank through the crankcase and the journals on the end of the crank start to machine their way into the crankcase, wrecking the crankshaft and or wrecking uh, the crankcase. So that, hap that happened on this car, I think, because one of the guys in the lot, when I worked at the dealer, um, tried to tow it in the ice and I think that, that jerk 
would have been enough to put the pressure on this plate. And then when they tried to start it up, the crankshaft was tight and it only ran for a little watt, like 30 seconds or something like that, but it was enough to damage and wreck the crank. So that car with everything else was, get this, a $75,000 recondition bill, not including the price of the car. So 928s are super expensive. Parts are really, really expensive and uh, doing any work to them is very labor intensive. So, you know, this car at around 15 grand is on the light end of the scale um, when you're talking about um, refurbishing a 928. Okay, and a quick word about uh, about costs, reconditioning costs, and so forth. I've done I've done a few of these videos uh, before, and I put I put you know spreadsheets and you know the money that I spent on the cars and the costs, and I I, I get these comments. Well, it doesn't cost that much. Well, you're getting ripped off. Well, you know I I spent way less maintaining my Mercedes than you did, or you're out to lunch or whatever. And so to that I. I don't, I don't know what to say. It, it, it really just depends on, on, you know, the level of, of reconditioning that you're, you know, prepared to, prepared, prepared to pay for or think is necessary. I mean, on one end of the scale, on, on an older Mercedes, uh, I had a 300 CE Cabriolet that sold into Germany that was owned by the, you know, the former owner of a, of a Mercedes-Benz independent repair shop. Um, Danish guy who was, you know, super meticulous. And on this 150,000 kilometer car, that was a beautiful car that had been maintained. Um, I think his bill was 13 or $14,000 in parts and a hundred hours of his own time. Now, this guy replaced all the fuses with the ceramic fuses that had copper wires instead of the aluminum wires. He replaced EGR valves and every filter and every known consumable in the car from top to bottom. And if you did that at a dealership and you took the 100 hours at $150 an hour or whatever, that's 15 grand in labor and another 15 grand in parts. It's a $30,000 bill to a car that already looked perfect. Okay, so you can go to that extreme. Um, and then there's, and then there's guys who, who, you know, just do the absolute minimum until the car breaks and you need to get it towed in and fix it, you know, the cheapest amount they can. So there's everything in between, you know, I probably take, you know, a position of going somewhere in, 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 in obviously in the middle of that, because you can't spend $30,000 on a, $20,000 car and get your money back. Um, uh, but, uh, and also we're in Canada. So, you know, there's shipping and duty and stuff for the parts that you may not have in other places. And if you're getting your Mercedes fixed in LA, you know, you might, you might have 50 different places you can go to and it might be a lot more competitive than in Canada. So I can only speak for what I, what, what we spend in Calgary, Canada, doing what I think is a really thorough job but not necessarily going in, you know, trying to make it a new car. Okay.